Welcome once again to St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York as we live stream our Holy Mass uh, today on the 19th Sunday in Ordinary Time. In your goodness and in your kindness, if you remember uh, Barb and Steve from Roanoke, Virginia, who are celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary. Also, uh, R Roland Dale Cornwell, who passed away on July the 1st. Also, please pray for two mayors who are our great uh, virtual parishioners, a mayor from Missouri and a mayor for West Virginia. And they're asking for wisdom and encouragement during this very difficult time. Also, the family of Susan Serrano has asked us to pray for her. And two of my very, very close friends are in hospital in very serious condition, Jean Riley and Tom Karens. Please remember them in your prayers. Last week, we had 179 actual parishioners here in the church celebrating. I think we have a few more today. I'm very happy to see that. And we had thousands and thousands more uh, throughout the country and throughout the world uh, praying with us and praying for the victims of the coronavirus and all of the attendant difficulties that the world is going through. So the assistance that people send us is very much appreciated. I, I can tell you from the bottom of my heart, um, as I open the letters and open and look at the checks, I'm very grateful uh, for so many people that have been so good to us. And I ask you please to continue that so that we can not only keep the lights on, but continue being a, a beacon of hope here in our country and here in our city. The celebrant of the mass today is his eminence, Timothy Cardinal Dolan, the Archbishop of New York. And as I said, we're celebrating the 19th Sunday in ordinary time. Thank you. In order to actively participate during the Mass, we ask that you download today's worship program on your smartphones or tablets at www.stpatrickscathedral.org live. We also ask that you please continue wearing your mask as you sing during the Mass. The entrance hymn is Blessed Jesus at Thy Word. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, peace be with you. Welcome to morning Mass here at America's Parish Church, everybody, St. Patrick's Cathedral, that we might offer this holy sacrifice of the Mass, the more worthily we call to mind our sins and ask for the mercy of Jesus. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I've done and in what I failed to do. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault, therefore I ask Blessed Mary Ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us. Forgive us our sins and bring us to life everlasting. Amen.
Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, whom, taught by the Holy Spirit, we dare to call our Father, bring, we pray, to perfection within our hearts the spirit of adoption as your sons and daughters, that we may merit to enter into the inheritance which you have promised through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. A reading from the Book of Kings. At the mountain of God, Horeb, Elijah came to a cave where he took shelter. Then the Lord said to him, Go outside and stand on the mountain before the Lord the Lord will be passing by. A strong and heavy wind was rending the mountains and crushing rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire, there was a tiny whispering sound. When he heard this, Elijah hid his face in his cloak and went and stood at the entrance of the cave. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, I speak the truth in Christ. I do not lie. My conscience joins with the Holy Spirit in bearing me witness that I have great sorrow and constant anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my own people, my kindred according to the flesh. They are Israelites. There's the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. There's the patriarchs, and from them, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is over all, God, blessed forever, amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord. After he had fed the people, Jesus made the disciples get into a boat and proceed him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. After doing so, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When it was evening, he was there alone. Meanwhile, the boat already a few miles offshore was being tossed about by the waves, for the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, he came forward toward them, walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. It is a ghost, they said, and they tried to cry out in fear. At once Jesus spoke to them, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter said to him in reply, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. Peter got out of the boat and began to walk on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw how strong the wind was, he became frightened and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught Peter and said to him, O you of little faith, why do you doubt? After he got into the boat, the wind died down. Those who were in the boat did him homage, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. Pardon me, please, uh, these uh, days of high summer, find me and something tells me probably you, um, reminiscing about summers in the past. 
And when I reminisce about summers in the past, I always think of my dear dad. Uh, this time of the year, uh, he would often, uh, we'd, uh, he'd throw me some pitches in the side yard. I'd be there at the, uh, with the bat, and he'd uh, pitch the ball to me. And any time I would miss, which was often, he would say, Tim, you got to keep your eye on the ball. You got to keep your eye on the ball. Sometimes he'd take me fishing. I would just have one of those bamboo poles with the little uh, bobber, remember? And you'd get a little distracted because you had to be patient. And I'd miss it when the bobble would begin to go up and down. And sometimes the fish would get away. And Dad would say, Tim, you, you got to keep your eye on the bob. Dad wasn't much of a golfer, but when I expressed interest, he tried to help me. And he would wear, guess what? When I'd swing at the ball and just have a little dribble, when the ball would just roll off the tee, Dad would say, hey, Tim, you got to keep your eye on the ball. And then what? When I was 16 and he was teaching me to drive, Tim, you got to keep your eye on the road. You getting a pattern here, folks? I think of that. I think of that with my dad today because of this masterpiece of a gospel that we have. Remember what happened in this morning's gospel? Jesus, Jesus is walking on the water towards his apostles, those fishermen who are being tossed around in a boat. And they see the master, Jesus, walking towards him on the water. And St. Peter, never one to pass up a chance, stands up and he says, Lord, if that's really you, tell me to walk to you on the water. Remember? And Jesus says, Peter, come. And Peter gets out of the boat, and guess what? Begins to walk on the water towards Jesus. And folks, you listen carefully here. As long as Peter keeps his eyes, keeps his eyes on Jesus, he literally can walk on water. But the minute he gets distracted, the minute he gets worried, the minute he gets anxious, the minute he gets afraid and begins to take his eyes off Christ and look at all the troubles and anxieties and distractions around him, he sinks. He sinks. My dad would appreciate that lesson. Peter, you got to keep your eyes on the Lord. Trouble in life comes, as we know, the hard way, when we um, kind of take our eyes off the basics of life. And you know as well as I do, there's nothing more basic than our faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the way, the truth, and the life. I can remember being very moved when I was a teenager with the Civil Rights Movement. And I remember the Reverend Martin Luther King, who would constantly tell his followers, especially in moments of trial and desperation, keep your eyes on the prize. Remember? Keep your eyes on the prize. My dad would agree. Jesus, Jesus would agree. Well, it's kind of a practical question. How, um, how do we keep our eyes on Jesus? As Peter did for a while. How do we keep our eyes on Jesus? I got a couple ideas if you're interested. If you're not, you're gonna hear them anyway. Uh, one, one way we keep our eyes on Christ is when we receive him in Holy Communion. Do you realize what an honor it is for us as priests 
to distribute Holy Communion? When I stand there Sunday after Sunday, and when and day, uh, days, weekdays as well, you come up to Holy Communion, and person after person, I find just staring with the eyes of faith upon the sacred host. And when I say the body of Christ, you're looking at the sacred host, the real presence of Jesus, and you respond, amen, which means I believe. You are keeping your eyes on Christ as you approach his real presence in the Most Holy Eucharist. I started off with a baseball analogy. Let me continue it. When I was a young priest, my first assignment at Immaculata Parish in St. Louis, we had a 5 p.m. Mass on Sunday. It was jammed. And do you know who would show up? So I was there from 76 to 79. You know who would show up often at that Sunday Mass? Stan the Man Musial. Stan the Man. He was retired from baseball by that time. But uh, see what had happened, and he, he would have been down at the 1 o'clock Sunday game at Bush Stadium, and he would have stuck around after the game, and then he'd drive home, and he would stop in for 5 o'clock Mass at Immaculata. He was a very fervent Catholic, as you probably are aware. And uh, very often, it would be Stan who would be approaching in my line for the distribution of Holy Communion. Now, I had heard... Uh, I had heard baseball analysis talk about the fact that, that, that Stan's prowess at the plate, one of the greatest hitters of all time, Stan's prowess at the plate would, were his eyes. The pitchers would talk about how intimidating it was to see Stan the man at the plate with his eyes focused on the ball. They would tease that Stan was staring so hard at that ball as it left their hands that he could count the threads on the baseball. Those eyes of Stan, the pitcher said, were penetrating. Folks, I saw those eyes as Stan the man would come up to receive Holy Communion. I was kind of in awe. He wasn't looking at me, he was looking at the sacred host. And I said, the body of Christ, and I saw those eyes staring at the real presence of our Lord in Holy Communion as he'd say, amen, I believe. Stan was keeping his eyes on Christ through Holy Communion. So there's one way. Here's a second. How about the Gospels? If, if, um, if we're going to get to know Jesus better, a great way, classically, is to contemplate him in the Gospels. That's where he comes alive. We uh, hear the Gospels every Sunday, or if you're lucky enough to go to daily Mass, or if they're part of your daily prayers, I hope they are. Boy, just to uh, meditate upon him in the Gospels is a great way to keep our eyes on Christ. Once again, when I was growing up across the street, from my house, uh, uh, some of my best, uh, two of my best buddies, and their mom was a very fervent Baptist, and her mom, their grandma, would often visit, and she was a really strong believer. And uh, one day, I can remember, it was 1964, it was in June, and I was getting ready, I was leaving eighth grade, and I was getting ready for my final exams for eighth grade to go into high school and all, kind of nervous. And I walked over, and there was their grandma sitting in a lawn chair in the shade, and she was reading. And I said, hi, Grandma. And she said, oh, hi, Tim. She said, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm, I'm preparing for my finals. I'm preparing for my finals. I said, what are you doing, Grandma? She held up the book, and it was the Bible, the Gospels. She held up the book and said, so am I. <laughs> She said to me, I'm preparing for my finals too. By that time, she was elderly. She was sick and fragile. She knew that her death was coming. She was prepared to stare Jesus in the face, literally, she hoped, with eternal salvation, keeping her eyes on Christ for all eternity. And she was staring at him 
on the pages of the Gospels. So there's just another way, everybody, the Gospels. And here's a third one. A third way to keep our eyes on Christ, like St. Peter did at least half the time, uh, through our prayer. Our prayer is a great way to keep focused on Jesus, to look him in the eye. Once again, early priests, when I was a young priest, I used to bring Holy Communion to a, a, a very sick man, and he was in the living room on a hospital bed, and he couldn't move. He was completely paralyzed. I think he had Lou Gehrig's disease, to keep the baseball analogy going here. And I can remember he, could, he couldn't move at all. And I would bring him Holy Communion every Friday, could just give him a little particle, and his wife would be there with the glass, with the straw. He could, with labor, take some of the water. The only thing he could move were, were his eyes, and uh, he could blink messages to his wife, and his wife would interpret them for me. And one day I'm standing there, a little, little visit before I gave him Holy Communion, and I saw that he was uncharacteristically agitated. He was kind of really blinking fast, and I said to his wife, uh, is he okay? And she kind of looked at me, and she looked behind me, and she said, would you mind standing off to the side a bit? And I, I did, and she said, see, when he's laying there, and I looked behind me, and there was the crucifix, the cross. She said, he always likes to stare at the crucifix. And you didn't know it, but you were blocking it. Oh, boy. In his prayer, he would simply look at the cross of Christ. He'd look into the eyes of Jesus on the cross. Bunch more of them, ways to keep our eyes on Christ. There are three of them, Holy Communion, the Gospels, and our prayer. You know, you often hear, everybody, that the, uh, the only two alternatives in life is to sink or swim. You got to sink or swim. I propose to you this Sunday morning, there's another one. Not just to sink or swim, but to walk on water. <laughs> and if we do, if we keep our eyes on Christ, life can become an adventure of walking on the water back to him for all eternity. <clears throat> I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. For our Holy Father, Pope Francis, for our shepherd, Timothy Cardinal Dolan, for all bishops, priests, and those who guide us in faith, that they may be holy and effective in their mission so. to draw all people to Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who work for the defense of life from its first moment, and for those who work for peace and for justice, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. 
For all who have experienced sexual violence, abuse, or harassment, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For American military throughout the world, especially those who are in harm's way, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who are suffering from the coronavirus, that they may be healed, and for the happy repose of all who have died from this sickness in recent weeks, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For peace and reconciliation among all communities in our country, for the recognition of the dignity and worth of all our brothers and sisters, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all of us gathered here today, that we may walk with, together with Christ, trusting in his loving presence, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. <clears throat> for all our beloved dead, that they may enjoy the fullness of eternal life, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We seek the perpetual help of Mary, our mother, of St. Patrick, our patron, and of St. Peter and the apostles as we make these and all of our prayers through Christ our Lord. <clears throat> the offertory hymn is How Firm a Foundation. sacrifice in yours may be acceptable to God our Almighty Father. Be pleased, O Lord, to accept these offerings of your church, for in, in your mercy you've given them to be offered, and by your power you transform them into the mystery of our salvation. Through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is, it is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Heavenly Father, Almighty and Eternal God, for you so love the world that in your mercy you sent us the Redeemer to live like us in all things but sin, so that you might love in us what you loved in your Son by whose obedience we have been restored to those gifts of yours that by sinning we had lost in disobedience. And so, Lord, with all the angels and saints of heaven, we too give you thanks as an exaltation we acclaim. of all holiness. 
Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread, and giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. This is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice. And once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. When we eat this bread and drink this, As we celebrate this memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you've held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world. Bring her to the fullness of charity together with Francis, our Pope, and Timothy, our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection, and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the blessed apostles, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say. Our Graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Amen. 
The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. With your spirit. takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. It has long been a Catholic understanding that when circumstances prevent one from receiving Holy Communion, it is possible to make an act of spiritual communion, which is a source of grace. Spiritual communion is an ardent desire to receive Jesus in the most holy sacrament and lovingly embrace him at a time or in circumstances when one cannot receive him in sacramental communion. The most common reason for making an act of spiritual communion is when a person cannot attend Mass. Acts of spiritual communion increase our desire to receive sacramental communion and help us avoid the sins that would make us unable to receive Holy Communion worthily. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things and I desire to receive you in my soul. Since I cannot at this minute receive you sacramentally, Come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. The communion hymn is Donde hay amor y caridad. Sempre estou 
Let us pray. May the communion in your most blessed sacrament that we have just consumed save us, O Lord, and confirm us in the light of your truth through Christ our Lord. Monsignor Ritchie, after Mass, I want to go over to St. Charbel's side altar to say a prayer for the people of Lebanon after the tragedy of this week. St. Charbel, a great saint venerated uh, by our beloved uh, Maronite Catholics in Lebanon. And our blessing now goes to uh, those who unite with us in prayer on uh, the Catholic Channel, Sirius XM 129, the Catholic Faith Network, and of course our live streaming. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Through the intercession of Mary, our mother, through the intercession of St. Peter and the apostles, vivid in this morning's gospel. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Saturday is the beautiful feast of Our Lady's Assumption into Heaven, August 15th. Don't forget, beautiful feast. Go in peace. The recessional hymn is There's a Wideness in God's Mercy. <laughs> 